live stream is on. So, okay. Um, so for this week, we read, or to any extent, you guys are welcome to participate and give your input. Um, we read uh, On Anger, or Of Anger, um, De Ira by Seneca um, in three books. I tried to give a variety of sources. So um, I, I was quite late in putting up in this event up, um, but in preparation, I really tried to give a really good breadth of sources. I gave two translations on the book, um, one from, they were quite early still, one from 1900, a little bit later from 1928. And then I gave two, I think were two good summaries, um, which compared Seneca's uh, notion of anger with Aristotle's which was news to me. I never knew that he was responding to Aristotle. You see him quote Aristotle within the book, but you also see him quote Plato and other, and other sources. But I was actually quite, um, quite surprised to notice that he, this was actually a response to um, perhaps building off of Stoicism, but a response to, uh, in, in, at least in part, to Aristotle's notion of anger, um, which I can understand. I guess Aristotle was such a big influence on them that um, he wanted to respond to him and not let him have the last word. Um, so my first, I didn't see any any main questions that anybody wanted to bring up about the topic, about anger, about the book. Um, but my first question is, what did everybody think? Does anybody have any first thoughts on the book? And if anybody wanted to make maybe ask a, a first main prompt or question about, about anger or about Seneca's book. So my first impression uh, is in uh, book one, part eight, uh, 1.8, which sounds a lot like my, uh, my Buddhist teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh. He talks, Seneca is talking about when we feel anger coming on, that we should be able to detect it and resist it. And that's very much how Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist, describes when he, he admits sometimes he feels anger and he addresses it almost as if it's a small child. Uh, he says, I see that you're coming and I will take good care of you. That's how a uh, similar idea. Of course, Buddhism and Stoicism have, have a lot in common, but I like that uh, 1.8 the best. I think that's the starting point for any of us. I noticed that too. Oh, sorry, Philip. Um, no, no, go ahead, please. I noticed that too, that the first few uh, parts of the book were a good opener, a good kind of preface to why he was talking about anger in the first place, um, kind of the basics. But then it started ar around uh, exactly as I was writing down some quotes. I'm um, around 1.6, uh, I started writing down a quote maybe, 1.8, then 1.9, because um, he really starts getting into the characteristics of anger, whether it's natural, whether it's... Um, uh, whether it's useful, it can be useful. Um, uh, and I really liked his, he always, whenever he talks about anger, it's always a comparison or a contrast. Um, he always contrasts it with um, uh, even other passions when he's talking about it as the most vile, where he talks about uh, if he, if he you know, responds to a, this hypothetical adversary or Aristotle, like, is it useful? He then compares it to reason, or he compares it to, um, he uses metaphors like that of a soldier. And I I think those are always really useful. Um, I'm not sure if that has to do maybe really with like the language they had, maybe in Greek, it was just always easier, their kind of system of thought that they always wrote that way or thought that way. But um, it made it really accessible. It wasn't highly theoretical. It was metaphorical and it always he always juxtaposed it with um, another passion or a virtue, like passions versus the virtues as being self sufficient, and that always made it seem understandable. Yeah, that's I definitely agree. I saw right there around one point eight, one point six, where he started really talking about the characteristics of it. And sorry, Philip. Yeah, thanks. Um, I um, yeah, I was just about to say um, I only managed to finish the first two books. Um, I didn't get around to the third, but um, what I um, noticed um, in um, a, a lot of his um, examples and all of the situation that he gives, it's all about um, preventing anger from taking hold. Um, 
he, he mentions a couple of times that um, he uh, he wants to talk about you know how to calm the angered mind, but it's all um, much more focused on um, not letting anger actually take over. So kind of like you were saying, uh, Dan, you know, it's like uh, in 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 a way to um, how do you say uh, to 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 pause, to reflect, and then to deal with the um, emotion and not let it uh, take over um, the mind. And he does say a couple of times uh, throughout the book, actually, that, um, you know, a, an angry uh, person um, is um, beyond the reach of, of reason. And uh, so, yeah, I found that very, very interesting. Um, another thing, um, I quite like the um, uh, beginning of book two um, because it was um, a little bit different um, I think the first maybe, um, I, I want to say maybe the first four or five when um, it actually does get a little bit more theoretical. He does talk about the, um, the um, how the passions arise in the moments when to uh, pause, when to hold um, your thought, when to interrogate your thoughts and um, either ascend or uh, not ascend. So I found that um, kind of um, section stands out a little bit from, from the rest. And the only um, theoretical um, part that, um, like I said, I haven't uh, managed to read the third part. I don't know if there's more in there, but this is like the, the part that kind of stood out to me from the rest. Mm. He, yeah, he, um, he, he also made good juxtapositions between theory and practice. Like he, he always, um, there were clear parts of the books and actually clear books, like you said, book. Um, actually, like we were saying, half of the, I mean, the first several parts of book one were kind of uh, leading up to what anger really is. The second half of book one was what anger is and what anger isn't and why you shouldn't use anger. Um, but I, I think in book but one and even in book two, there were some practical advice on how to not uh, go into anger. Um, there was a um, in in book one. Uh, I wrote down a quote actually. I wrote down some quotes actually that were useful, um, if I may. Um, I think this is where he starts really getting into it. Um, no. Yeah, I think it was. Um, I think it was you, Philip, who just said that he um, uh, he talks about it um, versus reason. Or he, he and uh, I, I really like this quote by him. And I think there's another quote he uses by Plato. Um, but uh, this quote really hit me when he says in one point eight that. Um, but argues our adversary, some men, when in anger, control themselves. Uh, and then he said, do they so far control themselves that they do nothing which anger dictates or somewhat? If they do nothing thereof, it becomes evident that anger is not essential to the conduct of affairs. Actually, that there was a better one. And now I, I'm not going to go looking for it, but there's a better one which he actually says much more than that. He doesn't only say that uh, anger is not necessary. Reason is the only necessary tool you could use to solve a problem. But he says that actually... Um, he Seneca actually says this multiple parts and multiple books that uh, he hates. He kind of hates the argument um, when somebody says, um, uh, um, uh, uh, "Yeah, but it can be good. It can be useful, uh, and he uh, it can be useful if you manage it, if you can control it." And he says, "Well, actually, that defeats the whole definition of anger. If you control anger and you use your rational." And then we'll, you know, we'll put aside the fact that the word rational, I guess as Gonzalo brought up last week, is a whole bunch of problems with how you define it. But if we broadly understand what rational means, it's like against the whole definition of anger. If you start thinking rationally and acting rationally, well, then you're not angry anymore. You waited and then you proceeded. Um, so there is, logically, if you define anger in, in the way that they define it, and I think the way we define it, there really is no way to use anger and reason at the same time. They're just completely, by definition, opposite of each other, um, which I thought was a compelling reason, because you can't get out of it. Unless you change the definition of anger, you just cannot get out of 
that logical contradiction. That's a great example or a way of describing it. Um, uh, the other favorite quote of mine is at 1.11 in anger where Seneca says, in no case is it less necessary since our attacks ought not to be disorderly, but regulated and under control. He's linking this idea of anger to a whole area of discussion in Stoicism, which is about why we, why we like reason and rationality, is it's the ordered side of our thinking. And of course, if we give in to anger, we're disordered or chaotic, and it leads to all kinds of injury and other problems. So I think I like how he's linking it so directly at 1.11. Nice. Um, maybe one, um, I, I found uh, one thing that I noticed um, that is not so much a philosophical point, but more a maybe a literary point, um, a way that he makes um, his writing very effective. Like this is something that Seneca is fantastic at, right? He, he writes in a way that really like gets to you and he he really evokes like very strong emotions in in reader and he does so sometimes at the cost of being um self-consistent and also maybe philosophically correct because in a couple of places he says that you know anger is the worst vice but uh, from a like strictly philosophical stoical point of view all the vices are equal like there is no degree of evil there is just bad and there is good and there is no um better or worse uh, in that realm of, of, of good or bad, but in order to make a strong point and uh, have a really um, strong impression on the reader, he very often says that anger is the worst of devices. Um, just to to drive um, to just to drive the home the the, the point, um, but um, yeah, on risk of of not being uh, entirely consistent with the philosophy. I thought it was very interesting. That's a that's a good point you make. I, there was one passage where he says, um, uh, I think he was quoting again this hypothetical adversary uh, arguing with him. Um, actually, a really good example of the Socratic dialogue in action. And he says that um, uh, he, the adversary says, "Yeah, well, it's not you know, it's um, if you can if you if you use anger manageably, it's." Um, it's not the worst evil. It's it's just something that could be, it's manageable that might have a benefit from it. And Seneca says, well, a, a worst evil, uh, sorry, a, 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 a lesser evil is still an evil. Like no matter how you say it, I think there's an end of a passage just like that. I think it's around actually where Dan was pulling from maybe 1.10, 1.11. And he says that, um, uh, yeah, that's exactly it. Thank you, Shukam. Yeah, it's uh, all that we gain by its moderation is that the less there is of it, the less harm it does. In other words, it's still harm, no matter how less of a degree or higher of a degree it is, which I think was really a good point, is that it's, you can't make the argument you're doing um, good if you're still doing harm, no matter how little it is. Yeah. Yeah, so I wrote some uh, questions. Yeah. yeah, he really, um, yeah, Philip, that's right. Yeah, he, it's the end. I don't know, the end of every book. I always take the quotes from the end of his, at the end of every 1.8, 1 1.9. Like you take the end few sentences. They're always, for some reason, he, he knows how to conclude something. He knows how to conclude an argument. I think two interesting points for me. Um, first, uh, so we haven't heard from. Um, I think I'm going to go around because uh, I don't have. I have a, a potential light frog, a, a potential prompt we can use for a basis of further discussion. But I wanted to see what any anybody else thought of the book and, and thought of their readings. Um, Tony or or Shakam, um, what did you guys think of it? What did you guys pull from from Seneca's on anger? Sure. Um, I think for me personally. Um, Obviously, it's I'm new to stoicism, so it's all just food for me. Everything I read about stoicism, um, but 
I'm lucky in a way because I've never really had a problem with anger. Um, so I think for me, I, I feel rather dispassionate about the text, even though it's very interesting. I think there, there are a couple of interesting um, parts of it, though. He says, just wait if you feel angry. Um, wait for the passion to disappear. And I think, how impossible would that be if you were suitably riled by a situation? Just wait. But I thought the wisdom in that is immense just from a perspective of self-control and temperance. So, as I say, for me personally, I don't think it's something that I'll apply to my life in any way. Um, it's more of an academic sort of study for me. But certainly his approach, and as Phil said, his literary style is very engaging. Um, so, yeah, very interesting stuff. Yeah, it's it's. I think it can tend to be more very very academic. Like his 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 book is basically a treatise, uh, a whole thesis on on anger. But I think um, uh, I think supplementing the the book with um, there's a good article I found I posted in the um, in the event description. Uh, this was a um, this is actually it's it's like a it's like medium, but it's uh, it's for anybody interested in wellness and spirituality. And um, the website's called High Existence, and this um, this um, author, this uh, blogger, had um, wrote a, a very long piece about like sixteen big examples, practical examples he took from Seneca's piece that were less theoretic and, and ways in which he tried to apply to his own life. Um, uh, I thought were really useful. I thought boiled it down. There were a couple of them that I was. Um, um, I thought he didn't phrase correctly, or maybe maybe I, I would think maybe we need to update Seneca's uh, some of Seneca's points. But um, overall, I think they were they were really it was really useful to ju to to um, at the same time look at Seneca's work and then look at this article because this article also boiled down some of the main points um, that Seneca was saying to use to uh, to to practice eliminating anger, like basically just wait and calm yourself down first, which I think actually I wrote down, I wanted to mention a, a kind of a main theme I, I saw in his work was basically to uh, un remember ataraxia. Um, I think often we, um, we read, we look into these topics and we practice stoicism and we sometimes forget, I think Shakam pointed out this, this last time or the time before, and he said, "Remember the virtues," and this got me thinking. Like maybe every time, every every meeting, we should do this. We say, "Remember the virtues," and I was also thinking, "Remember ataraxia," because the Stoics, it wasn't their highest goal, but it was something they still wanted to attain by practicing the virtues. And I think Seneca also mentions this in his books that um, you want to maintain a tranquil state of mind. You want to kind of be. Um, a good trend. The best translation I found anywhere was unperturbed. You you want your mind to be in control and unperturbed, and um, getting to the state of ataraxia, and then that will hopefully prevent any further releases of anger. So I thought it was a really good te technique. As long as you get there, um, it's not a. Uh, that's kind of your best preventative measure, I think. Um, if you can't. Uh, um, uh, like the any more you can do, I don't think we can ever really prevent it completely. It's understandable, but that's perhaps a good um, way to prevent most of it or recognize when it happens. Sorry, just one point. Um, one thing I noticed was that he says to see yourself in the offender, um, to compare yourself um, to the actions of another before you react. And I just thought that was a very sort of um, Christian um, way of looking at it. I think Jesus talks about, you know, before you look at the speck in your brother's eye, you know, look at the big piece of wood in your own or something of that nature. So were these guys familiar with the teachings of Jesus and, and um, other Christian writers at that time? 
it's it's actually funny you point that out. We had a meetup on on the connection to Christianity and Stoicism back in November, I think, um, when we were still meeting in person. And um, uh, so, I mean, it, I I don't think Christian writers were too, at least, um, uh, as pervasive as they were come the um, um, come the Middle Ages, um, because it was in the Middle Ages when this kind of early Middle Ages, um, maybe after the, um, finally after the uh, first millennium, that uh, the, these kind of, there was actually a neo-Stoic movement. And this neo-Stoic movement was um, just a short history, was basically started by Christian theologians looking into Stoic writings. And then they applied Stoic virtues to Christianity. So actually it's the other way around. It's uh, Christianity borrows a little bit from Stoicism. So far as I know, that's I, I did one meetup on this. I did some research, um, but this is that's I, I, that's the uh, kind of a good foundation that I got from from the, my history lesson. I agree. That's what the the scholars uh, seem to be leaning towards. <clears throat> also in the um, chat area, I put a comparison between anger one point sixteen and meditations two point one. Uh, he, in anger, uh, or in the essay on anger, Seneca reaches the conclusion that to be angry with someone who is, quote, bad would be a sin following another sin. That's his conclusion. Why would you follow sin with more sin? And in Meditations, Marcus says, uh, I can't be angry with my brother because he is my kin. Even Maybe not by blood, but uh, Marcus reaches a, a different conclusion but, you know, uh, obviously still both of them are very stoic statements. I like that they're each expressing their ways, um, reaching a certain uh, nuance, you might say, in their teaching. Am I? Yes, I am. Uh, that's super interesting. Um, there's a couple of... Um, interesting points that were raised uh, just now, but I just want to jump in on this because um, I don't know where these uh, phrases come from, but um, I did find a lot of um, quotes um, that um, later uh, writers also seem to have um, uh, you not not necessarily used, but um, for example, I mentioned Meditations 2.1, um, where, um, you know, Marcus is basically saying, you know, you're going to meet ungrateful people and um prepare yourself but there was one point and i didn't write it down i've been trying to find it again but in one section um seneca basically says the exact same thing just you know 50 50 years before it's almost verbatim uh, the exact same thing that he says um so i found that very interesting from a like a historical connections kind of point of view um to what you said uh before tony um you know when you're really riled in in, in the moment and uh pausing it's extremely difficult um and you said that um you're not uh, the angry type and that might not be um super applicable um but i think this could be um this is this is useful for any kind of um a useful technique for any kind of temptation any kind of um you know thing that um is maybe uh yeah any, any kind of impulse that is, that is driving you to do something that you uh, that you know you shouldn't. It could be anger. It could be um, uh, something as simple as I don't know. You're trying to um, eat healthy, but there's this you know this this thing that you really want to eat uh, that you know is bad for you. Um, it could be that um, I don't know. It could, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. So I'm just, just uh, the things that I struggle with uh, in my life. Let's say <laughs> I can give as examples, um, but um, yeah, it could just be. Um, anything really like the, the, it's, it's such a powerful it's such a simple thing that's so hard to master but it's so powerful um to just whatever it is you know do you really want to do this do you really want to get into an argument online with some person who you know doesn't doesn't really care one way or the other uh do you really want to get uh, riled up do you really want to sacrifice um, your long-term goals for some uh, short-term satisfaction benefit um and pausing in those moments of, of uh, when you're making that decision, um, it's uh, so difficult to master, like you said yourself, but it's such a powerful uh, technique, not only um, for um, anger. 
Yeah, Tony. And thanks for raising your hand, by the way. I think I think now just to raise your hand now we have a you have a, a Abdul here. Yeah, I think um, it reminds me of T.S. Eliot, a quote by him from The Hollow Men, between the motion and the act falls the shadow, I think it is, or something of that nature. Um, so th there's a shadow in between our initial reaction and how we should actually act. You know, so there is space there, there is time for the rational mind to consider how we should react. Um, so yeah, you're right, Phil. It, it's not just about you know the situations where there's anger. It's absolutely everything for me. It's exercise. I should exercise more. I choose not to. It's a logical choice, completely illogical at the same time. Um, but yeah, there's always that space where I have, have the opportunity to, to reconsider what I do. So you know what I'll do, Phil? I'm going to take your advice and your pointers. The next time I'm in that situation where I should be doing exercise, um, so thank you for the practical um, points, which I shall um, integrate into my day to day. Thanks. Nice. I'm glad to hear. Um, I like it. I just, uh, I'm just going to uh, make one uh, final small point and then um, I'll, um, yeah. Um, what you said about uh, Christianity, um, again, it's not necessarily super um, philosophical, perhaps, but again, like a super interesting historical connection. There's actually in the fourth century, um, some, um, I cannot remember his name, some uh, early Christian um, church official actually forged um, letters between Seneca and I think the Apostle Paul, I think. Um, and um, because of that, uh, Seneca was actually a pretty influential figure in early church history. Um, and um, the early church uh, fathers, um, they were actually looking at his writing um, to um, yeah, um, um, basically they based a lot of their um, early doctrines on uh, the writings of Seneca, and they're saying that, you know, even though he was a heathen, uh, he was one of the good ones. Um, so, yeah, like you were saying before, so see if it's kind of the other way around, that um, actually uh, the Christians took a lot from uh, Stoic philosophy in the early days. That's quite interesting, though. I never... Um... I never knew about the uh, this forgery. That's they I, that that look that. What I'm saying is that's greater lengths than I thought the church went to to uh, to. Um, I, I wouldn't say steal because what are we doing? But applying these same principles and using them from day to day. But I mean that's a that's a complete mapping of one philosophical doctrine to a religious one. That that's incredible. They that systematically, uh, Dan. Yeah, we're we're talking about <clears throat> the uh, the responses that we have that could be angry. Uh, the way it was just discussed reminds me of the great quote by Viktor Frankl, who says, "Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response." And of course, that not only ties together all of Victor's writings, but he, of course, was influenced by Stoicism. We know this for a fact when he created uh, REBT and CBT and those things. So it's, um, it's another great way to express it in a modern sense, I think. Of course, he was psycho a psychologist, so that's how he's, he's, uh, he's doing it. He's expressing it in those terms. Um, I just wanted to um, jump in and just uh, say hello to Abdul uh, for joining us. Uh, we never get a chance to, to say, um, uh, hey there. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's good to Hello, have you. Sir. Can you hey. hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. It's been a pleasure joining you again. Um, yeah, sorry, I was having another meeting before. So uh, apologies for being late. But yeah, thanks for having me again. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have any input, you want to say anything, just, uh, just jump in, raise your hand, and uh, you can be given the floor to speak. So... Um, yeah, that's a really good connection, Dan, um, between Victor Frankl and uh, and Seneca. This um, this, and I think I've said this. I, I've said this before, but it it just any time I read uh, Roman or Greek philosophy, I I have this sense that they never even, and rightly so, because the 
the kind of the field of psychology didn't really exist back then, but they, I don't think they really saw a distinction between philosophy and psychology. The, the methodology, the, the logic, the application of it, there was just no distinction between it. It was just one and the same, which is why anytime I read that, like, I mean, aside from their metaphysics, that, that's a whole different story, but from their um, uh, philosophy on emotion, it's really like a cognitive theory. That's all it is. It's incredible that they had done this. They covered this much, um, especially this um, this early early understanding of stimulus and reaction um, was so far advanced. Then it, it almost seems like did the psychologists, uh, did the behavioral psychologists in the twentieth century? Um, really have that much deeper of an understanding of psychology than they did. I mean, I mean sure, I'm sure they did just from the, the data they collected and the, and the experiments they performed, they can deduce a lot more, they can induce a lot more. But from the theory, I think there was, um, uh, they didn't start anywhere differently, in other words. Um, a little bit like how in CBT, the, a lot of the theories based on those kind of um, assumptions and um, phrases that the Stoics used. Um, one thing I'll say just before, um, in, unless anybody else wants to wants to say something, but just to begin a, maybe a new a new point of discussion, uh, I I understand um, he often Marcus Aurelius I, I see this quote Chacon posted and Seneca also mentioned um, that anger is contrary to nature. Um, I was kind of thinking in my head that it kind of is and it kind of isn't from uh, different interpretations. If you consider anger something natural that just comes about that you kind of have to remove from yourself. Um, there really is no two sides of, um, there really is two sides of the coin that you could argue against anger by arguing it is either natural or unnatural. I don't know, I had this, uh, when Gonzalo, um, I, I, I see your hand, um, when Gonzalo had mentioned last week about rationality and this problem of this vagueness of the word, I was thinking of the same thing about the word natural. Um, that you could uh, you could either consider the practice of removing anger as natural or unnatural. Anger itself is natural, unnatural, and you would. I don't think it really matters. Um, I was quite interested in in that fact that he kept. You know, the Stoics always place this emphasis on virtue and nature, but um, I think nature itself was something that I've I've always had a problem with, but I've learned to kind of ignore for the most part. Um, and whenever I hear nature, I think of virtue instead. That was kind of my solution for it, uh, Shakam. So, um, yeah, just a second uh, then. Um, I think I starts uh, the first book with a description of an angry man. And this description sounds like animalistic and uh, and wild and barely human. Uh, this this madness that uh, anger inf inflicts uh, upon men. So that's um, that's uh, yeah one of uh, the questions uh, I posted. Is anger human? Is uh, or is it an animalistic uh, instinct? Because I, I see two um, two aspects or two parts to to anger. One of them is really the physical response, um, the violence uh, or the wish, the desire for violence, and the other part is um, more like uh, Aristotle, uh, the, this desire that drives you. Uh, to fantasize about revenge, um, about payback. And I think we call both of these uh, aspects anger, but I think the experience is completely different. What do you think? Can you recall both of these uh, uh, parts anger? Is it the same emotion? Um, 
one of them is immediate and physical the other a more a um, how to say drawn out and lengthy and more um, in the fantasy land um what do you say yeah responding to your uh two-part comment there the physical response or the immediate response that comes up front is uh, I remember how a friend of mine, a psychologist, described this idea in evolutionary biology. They talk about that immediate response as being something that might have been needed for survival, you know, long, long ago. But now we're in a modern age and we can respond to things differently. We can not just be stoic about it. We can be thinking about it. But uh, that need for immediate physical response is no longer there because we're not in such danger. Now, of course, if a car, if, if we're walking, let's say, next, next to a street and a car rushes up on the sidewalk, well, we're certainly allowed to quickly get ourselves out of the way and that flight or that physical response is necessary. You might even feel a little jostled or angry afterwards, but then you should calm yourself down and realize I've gotten myself out of this situation. But Long, long ago, maybe, I don't know, thousands, millions of years ago, we, uh, we, uh, the anger response may have had a, a similar purpose to get ourselves out of harm's way. Um, yeah, it's... Uh... I, I, de I definitely uh, agree that it's something that is um if you if you consider anger like that if you consider anger like that that first initial response to maybe a surprising or in uh, um what's a better word for it um, yeah a surprising situation or something that happens to you um I definitely agree it's um it's it can be both animalistic and human if we consider it like that um but I, I think the the way Seneca defines it, the way Stoics define it, actually helps to remove that remove that problem. Actually, I think um, uh, uh, anger is as defined by the Stoics is this idea that you want to take revenge on somebody for what they did. Um, uh, also also kind of still exists maybe in in some tribes we don't know of around the world or earlier in society when there were no state systems or societies as complex as we have now even the greeks had um when they were um when when we were much more tribal and we had to defend our place and defend our reputation i think anger was a little bit of, of use in order to keep that society stable but you're right. Now it's it's n n nothing of use for us. It's nothing of value. Um, I like the fact that uh, just to maybe answer a question before I, I give the floor to Philip. That um, I I like the way in which Seneca defines it because um, I think he's right in in saying that it is really a human element, not animalistic. Because um, if we consider ourselves not animals in this respect, that we have these higher level cognitive functions and this higher intelligence. Um, because uh, I don't think animals have that initial response to a situation, but they don't feel any kind of lingering anger. Like I really like that example of the, the boar or, or whatever animal that goes, just goes on grazing on the field right after he feels that intense emotion. We don't do that. Humans have a tendency to like hold this grudge against other people. And um, I think, so I think it is more human. We have a tendency to kind of prolong these thoughts and, and emotions over a period of time. Uh, Philip. Uh, thank you. Um, I actually, um, I, I, I um, don't disagree. Um, I just want to maybe um, raise a counterpoint, um, which is that um, uh, we are, in stoic terms, defined by our ability to reason. And that's what um, unites us um, as the human uh, cosmopolis, um, I think is the term. Um, and um, if anger, um, I think Seneca defined it as temporary insanity, and we give up 
um, our um, defining feature or ruling capacity. Um, and that reduces us, in a sense, um, to this animalistic state um, that, that um, defines us and also separates us from uh, um, animals that uh, don't have the same ability to con control their um, actions to the same degree that we do. Um, so, so it's hard. Um, it's actually a really hard question to say whether it is uh, a human or a, an animalistic uh, thing. It has probably elements of both. Um, but yeah, um, very, very difficult to answer. Um, I want to say one thing, um, and this is maybe like a, a little bit of a personal anecdote. Um, I hope I, I can. Um, when I um, started studying uh, Stoicism, started practicing Stoicism, um, I was um, in, um, yeah, but I, I had just moved away from, from where I lived before. And so I didn't see my friends for a long time. And I was uh, in the practice of um, Stoicism. I was very deep in the practice at the time. Um, and when I've seen my um, friends again, um, for the first time after you know, practicing for like nine or 10 months or so, uh, very diligently. Um, one of my friends said to me that I appeared much less angry. And that really struck me because I never thought of myself as an angry person. Um, and um, I couldn't really, you know, I couldn't really say why that is. And, and that uh, still like a year or more than a year later, um, I'm still thinking about this, um, that our self perception uh, and the way that other people perceive us is perhaps um, very different and um, that this um, practice um, that we do, this interest that we have um, really is very um, effective and very, and, and it does have a, a, a positive effect on um, our lives. And like I said, I never considered myself an angry person. I'm coming from a, a household, I was brought up in a household where um, yelling was basically the default mode of communication so it's like it's perfectly like it, it, it doesn't um strike me as um necessarily you know and like it doesn't have to be an argument like you can you know you can talk loud with each other and you don't have to have an argument it doesn't mean the same thing it's just because i was brought up in like a in in an environment like this but for other people like they um they see this very differently and um yeah it's it's uh crazy how um, effective, like you said, so Steve, is that this is basically um, a type of uh, therapy of the mind. Um, yeah. Um, that's a that's a really good counterpoint, though. I mean, that makes sense, like logically. Um, uh, humans have this defining quality of anger. And I'm sorry, defining quality of reason. So uh, anger would be animalistic in that respect, because um, uh, if uh, mm, we were the only creatures to feel anger, anger would be a kind of defining quality of humans, <laughs> uh, even if we could remove it, like even if we could remove it after the fact of, of being born with this kind of instinct or being trained with this kind of instinct, it would be a defining feature of, of humans. Um, I think, yeah, I think you're, I think you're right that it's, it's kind of a, it, it, it may be something that's definition, definition, definitional. It may be something that we can never resolve unless we either define it in a certain way. We get some cognitive scientific evidence of animal brains and human brains. Um, and it might just be a matter of how you define anger as temporary madness, as, um, watching this recent video of um uh yeah there's this this youtube channel i can't remember because it's it's not something i watched somebody had showed it to me and there's this good episode where this um uh, this uh person who's um training to become uh a kind of a um, police or fbi investigator assistant and he basically trains himself to observe people's reactions and what they mean what the reactions that they get questioned about tell that person tell the observer like uh, is this person um hiding something based upon their facial reactions and the conclusion he made was that as 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 much as you there are this there is some normality like there is some kind of 
homogeneity, homogeneity in the reactions people have, maybe because of culture and, and region, um, it's really difficult to tell because a lot of people may feel anger, may, may, may literally feel anger and look like they have anger differently. Like some people may throw a chair, some people may look like they're calm, but the reason why they look so calm and staring at you is because they're angry. So it's, it's um, I, I realized after that, and this was actually something I only realized now, I saw this video several weeks back that, um, that that was something I could I could criticize him about. That maybe um, uh, um, uh, that the, maybe a big difference between us. Maybe ang anger is animalistic to an extent, but what is not animalistic is I think for a lot of other animals in the animal kingdom, they kind of have this same reaction. But with humans, it's we 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 know our faces so well that sometimes it's difficult to tell what kind of reaction we're showing. And what a reaction that person has because some people show it differently. I thought that was interesting, kind of a nice rebuttal to him. I didn't really like that part. I didn't really like the part where he was describing the face and everything because I was like, sometimes I just don't look like that when I get angry. That, that's yeah. a very good point, Steve. Um, in the old days, I think like in the 1800s, uh, part of our culture was that if someone stared at you a long time, it was menacing because you didn't know what they were going to do. You know, maybe they'd pull out a gun and shoot you or or something like that. That's how the Wild West could have been. But um, yeah, that's so that's uh, just the staring part has an interesting uh, history to it. I have to say, I, I have to leave early today, but I've really enjoyed the conversation. And I think Shacham made a very good uh, point about the two components of anger. I wrote that down. That's a good one. So thank you all so much. I'll ho I hope to see you next time. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Dan, for joining. See you. Uh, Shakam. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I was just about to uh, pay, um, paste this uh, quote. Um, and So I, to answer, uh, it's an open question uh, for everybody. Um, I think that uh, you know doing something once, uh, you no, know, it uh, can be a, a mistake. Um, doing something twice is a pattern. So if you drink a beer. It doesn't mean you're drunk. If you got scared, it doesn't mean you're a coward. If you got angry, it doesn't mean um, that uh, you lost uh, your ability uh, uh, to to live uh, in a, um, with temperance uh, and a virtuous life. So, connecting to before experiencing the first uh, part. The physical part, um, this immediate response, is you know just giving you information about the situation. Um, but actively lingering uh, uh, on the on the anger, then maybe you started to lose uh, your uh, your virtues. Um, maybe you should ask yourself, um, what can I, what can I do uh, better? How can I stop this um, this fantasy? Um, but uh, no, it's it's more of a, a question. So uh, what I wrote is um, making uh, anger your first. And, some, and some, sometimes on the response, keeping yourself angry may lead to suffering and bitterness. And and just about about it uh, in in general. Yeah, Philip. Um, it's a shame that uh, Dan is gone because he mentioned his Buddhist. Um, 
teacher. Um, I think it's an idea from Buddhism about the two arrows um, that I think applies here as well. Like feeling anger um, is in a way, um, you know, like we like to distinguish between the, the, the initial impulse, the, the kind of knee-jerk reaction, and then our um, our dealing with this uh, impulse and dealing with it virtuously. And this idea of the two arrows is um, that you cannot escape the first arrow, but you can escape the second one. Pain is uh, a given, uh, but suffering is optional, I think is what it's called in, in uh, Buddhism. I think I'm not an expert, but think I really like this idea of the two arrows because it really um, it's a very striking um, picture. So feeling anger, um, it's not um, um, it's not a failure to live a virtuous life as you um, posted in your question I think um, same as with any of the other um, uh, vices um, that we deal with um, but uh, like you said yourself um, our uh, dealing with it and our pattern of behavior towards it um, make or break our um, virtuous uh, virtuousness yeah that's a that's a, a my opinion as well um virtues are something that uh here to in the long term a momentary lapse is is uh, it's not uh, say a failure um and uh, i think this um it's very easy to fall into this um all or nothing mentality like like the easiest example with the uh, with a diet um if you want to keep a, a diet but like you ate something uh, you ate too, too much or you had something you, you're not supposed to and then you say Oh well, it's it's too late. I I I ate uh, the chocolate. And now uh, the whole diet is ruined. That won't help you in the long term. But saying, okay, I I know what my values are. I know what I want to keep. And trying to keep that in mind, and not losing. All the uh, not losing the, the the like the north um, when uh, there is a temporary uh, how say uh, loss of uh, direction. I don't know how to how to explain it. Yeah, Tony. Yeah, I'd just like to touch on Phil's points from earlier. Phil, you said that you were brought up in a sort of shouty um, household. I was myself. Um, but I, I'm a father now, and I'm actually very grateful that I was. Um, and it might sound strange, because it, the one thing I learned was how not to do it. How not to, um, to conduct myself as a father, as a, as a human being. So even before I discovered stoicism, I think I was quite stoic in my approach. Um, but I think we can look at those experiences if we've had negative experiences on our past in a really positive way. Um, and that's certainly something that I try to do um, on a practical basis. And stoicism has just really bolstered um, that for me. So yeah, quite interesting point, um, Phil. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, and actually what you said yourself, like trying to look at those experiences in um, a positive light and um, learning from them, that is something that's fundamental uh, to Stoic uh, thought and the philosophy, I think, absolutely. Um, there's this um, quote by um, Marcus Aurelius about, um, you know, the obstacle becoming the way, something like that. Um, and I think this is exactly it. Right. Um, you've had those obstacles, you've had these difficult experiences, but um, 
you just learn to um, accept them, uh, take them in because you can't really do anything about it. It doesn't, you know, it makes not, it, it doesn't make sense to be angry or bitter about it. Um, but rather, you take them in for what they are, and you do the best with them. And um, you're um, you're better father for it. You're um, creating a better atmosphere in your house for it. And I'm I'm trying to do the same. I'm trying to uh, still struggling um, as uh, everybody else is uh, with different things. But um, yeah, what you said is uh, it's fundamental um, to it's 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 at the core of stoicism. Uh, what I'm trying to say. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I was gonna say that. Um, I was gonna say something similar, actually. That that's it. But you put it better than I did. Like Marcus Aurelius's quote really captures it. That um, uh, it's it's in the past and it's something you did. And it instead of treating it as something terrible, you're treating it as kind of an advantage. You're changing your perspective on. It. You're saying, I, okay, it, it's something I've done. I can't change that. And instead of um, dwelling on that fact, which would probably be make you more angry, you're basically turning this into a tool to never do it again, which is really, really powerful. Yeah, that's exact. That's exactly a, um, a stoic technique. And I'm actually looking at this, um, um, uh, looking at the uh, this, this summary of CBT techniques too. Um, and I, I don't even think it's, it's on here. This is something that's very, very stoic. This idea of turning, uh, it's also probably something universal that you could, you could see in other cultures. Um, uh, something that uh, if, if you ever read um, uh, uh, Sun Tzu's work on the art of war, he does this all the time, changing a, a disadvantage to an advantage uh, in some way um, is, um, is a really powerful tool and basically helping you to grow and learn. Um, but it, I think it's also general. I mean, they, the Stoics talk about changing your perspective in a situation, like understanding the other person's uh, side of it. And this is also changing your perspective on your own experiences. Um, yeah, it's just something something really powerful. Gratitude also, you mentioned gratitude, Tony, which I really like, is something that we often forget that um, you have to... Um, you have to kind of embrace yourself and love yourself and, and be grateful for yourself and the experiences you've had in order to actually reach that point. Uh, Philip. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks. Um, and actually uh, what you said just now kind of leads back nicely around into a circle of um, at the beginning of the discussion about the, on anger. Um, and also what um, Tony mentioned earlier as well um, is that, you know, um if you look at um you know the mistakes of other people and the reasons that you um come up with why you, why why it's justified uh, and i use that in in air quotes why it's justified that you're angry um you're only looking at the failings of other people um and you're blind to your own shortcomings um so yeah that's a nice uh coming back around to the text i can I, I i made the uh, mistake not writing down um, notes and uh, uh, references to books and, and uh, chapters. Um, but I, that was one of those things that um, stuck with me. So I think it's towards the end of book two where he talks a lot about this um, in, I think, a couple of sections, actually, uh, not just a single one that, um, yeah, we should uh, look to ourselves uh, more than towards other people. Uh, go ahead, Tony. I was, I was finished. Oh, thanks. Yeah, right, Phil. It, it's quite a, a mirror of Marcus Aurelius at the beginning of Meditations, where he's talking about all the positive things he learned from people. Um, but we can flip that and say, well, I learned how not to do it from him, how not to be, you know, from her. Um, so it's an interesting comparison. Um, I think we must just absorb those negatives. Um, and learn as much as we can from them as reasonable human beings and make sure our future is better than our past. Yeah. Um, as we're turning into the next hour, I kind of wanted to turn this discussion just from theory. And, and I think uh, um, 
talking about anger is really like this is a really good discussion. We needed to understand what anger is and um, uh, different perspectives on anger and, um, and where anger comes from. Um, but I, I think this is actually also a good transition as we're talking about um, using angry experiences from the past or changing a perspective. I think in the next hour, we should start talking about like techniques in order to prevent or hold off anger. Um, but this is a really good starting point, like changing your perspective in the moment when you become angry. Um, I, I, the first thing you should do is always, I think we've said this already, to, to stop and wait. Um, but that I, after you stop and wait, it's kind of like, I guess, a question I would have and most people would have is what to do next. And that's a really good, that's a really good first step, maybe, is to what to do next is to start thinking about that other person. Um, and uh, understand that um, they may be coming from a different situation or understanding them as not a threat, understanding like um, what they're saying to you or doing to you is not harmful. I mean, maybe it is in a very extreme situation. That's another story. But we're talking about these kind of day-to-day -day experiences of dealing with angry people who are being angry at us. And I think um, our minds kind of start to think of them as threats. But the first thing we should do is actually understand that they're not threats. They're not doing anything to us. Nothing's harming us really. It's just, it's just their words and that's nothing they can do to us can really hurt us. So um, can injure us. Something he talks about all the time actually is injury. And that if we don't understand ourselves as injured, there's nothing to take revenge on. There's nothing to be angry about afterwards. Yeah, um, I think nobody's raised their hands. So maybe I'll, I'll say something again. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't want to uh, say too much, take Go over ahead. the whole thing. Um, yeah, um, actually, uh, I'm I'm not a. Uh, let, let me let me start here. Um, I think a great example of this kind of um, mindset, where where this would be, where this is like really apparent how um, how blind we often are. Um, is driving actually um, if you're in a car right? um, it's, it's like this uh, stereotypical idea of you know it's like everybody is a shitty driver except for me and how dare this guy cut me off and it's like did you see what this idiot just did um, it's very easy to fall into this trap when you're driving it's very very easy and um, uh, yeah but every every time we make a mistake right every time we just kind of squeeze into the the, the lane and maybe the one time that we forget to check something or whatever it's just you know it's an honest mistake you know these things can happen um and um it, it's really apparent how we apply this um double standard and how putting ourselves into another person's um perspective um can help us from uh becoming angry in those situations and and you know it's like not honking and not uh, you know like starting to yell at a person you have to Imagine the situation, how absurd it actually is if you're sitting in the car and you're angry at somebody who's like, he, he, this person doesn't even have, you know, any conception about you, of you. You're sitting in the car and you're angry about something and there's meters of space and, and steel and glass in between you and like literally nothing that you do has any impact and bearing on this person's day. So it, it's it's uh, yeah, a perfect example of uh, temporary insanity if, if you're um, that kind of... Uh, uh, if you have this kind of tendency while you're driving. Um, yeah, I, I, I really like this example. I, I don't know where I came across this, but uh, it's such a striking um, yeah, situation. Um, yeah. Well, I, I can tell you this happened to me today. <laughs> I wanted to mention it because I was, so I'm riding my bike home and um, three, four hours ago by now. And I am in, actually, I'm not even in, uh, the car lane. There's this is a three lane road. Two of the lanes are um, for cars, and the other lane is for bikes and buses. So I'm in the bus lane dri driving my bike, and um, there's a red light, and one of the cars tries to basically, I don't know if they're, I don't know what's happening. They're they're cutting me off, or they want to reach a space where they can park, but they clearly don't see me because the the car is here, I'm here, and they just I'm still driving up to the light, and they just do this, so they clearly don't see me, and I say. Whew, Okay, so I, I, I turned the brakes. That, that was my first instinct was b before I even get angry was to stop my brakes. And uh, I just slowly try and go around the car. And they clearly still don't see me. 
And so imagine imagine trying to hold, hold off your anger once, but then they do it twice because then they start turning the car to park and they still don't see me. They 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 just are not seeing me at all. Um, and uh, I I did actually after that first time I was just going to drive up to the right light. After the second time I turned my head because <laughs> I I just um uh, I guess out of not enough practice of doing this. After that second time that happened, just seconds afterwards, I, I I reacted. My my body just was looking back, was like, "What's going on?" Like I'm um, the same car did this twice to me right now. Um, but uh, I I just went up to the light. I, I parked, but I I did have that initial reaction. I looked back. I was like, "What is this guy doing?" Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it happened to me right now. That's why it, I thought it was funny you mentioned that example because that's a really good example, uh, Tony. Yeah, it is an interesting example. Uh, I'm in Poland at the moment. I don't know whether anybody's been to Poland. Um, we have, I don't know whether you've sampled the driving in Poland. Um, you know, it's like Russia, basically. You see those videos online of things that happen in Russia. So it, when I take my boys to school or, you know, it's it's a pretty much a daily occurrence, six or seven times a day. And you have to learn patience. You just have no choice. Otherwise, you'd end up in a ditch somewhere, you know. So it's about survival as well, just being patient. Um, but it, it sort of reminds me of Liverpool also because Liverpool, I don't know whether you guys have been to Liverpool, um, but people are very emotional generally in Liverpool um, and quite angry. So again, in two places that I've lived, um, I've had to learn patience. Um, and Steve, I would say that that guy or that woman who did that to you, probably could have been me because I'm probably the worst driver I know, um, which also makes me be more patient too. That's a, that's a really, um, uh, I wouldn't say anti-stoic way, but it's a, I think it's a really interesting way of looking at it. It's a, <laughs> when you change perspectives, not only do you think that they're not seeing me, okay, that's a mistake they made, but uh, it's a it's a case of they're a bad driver. I can't do anything about it. <laughs> I guess I shouldn't get angry about it. Um, yeah, they were probably really bad drivers. Nothing I can nothing I can control. It's out of my control. It's an external event. So I should just keep driving. But uh, yeah, it's a good point. <laughs> yeah. um, actually, um, oh, Shakam, go ahead. Yeah, all uh, scousers uh, so uh, passionate and uh, angry. Um, could, you, could you say that again? Oh, uh, are all uh, scousers um, so uh, angry all the time? People from Liverpool, yeah. Uh, I, I think you could generally characterize it being, as being a, an overriding emotion of people from Liverpool, even though. You know, you can't overly generalize, but yeah, it's quite common, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, so um, I wanted to talk about um, uh, CBT relaxation uh, techniques and the um, uh, connection between physical and postponed uh, uh, stress and tension and anger. Uh, but now, um, I'm just thinking about uh, driving uh, in uh, in India and driving uh, in Israel um, and trying to cross uh, the road in uh, Neukölln and it's basically the same experience um, and I think um, mismanagement of emotion and anger is like the I say the strongest of all the passions. Um, hey, oh, hey, I think, yeah, as you said, it's very uh, connected to, to driving and how you hold yourself in public and uh, how you interact with others. Um, so just a uh, a thought uh, that I had. 
um, is there like a very clear virtue and vice relations like temperance uh, uh, and anger a uh, courage uh, and and cowardness um will wisdom be ignorance um and is there a how to say the extreme variant of like you know anger and and violence is there a similar thing with um wisdom ignorance what would be the action of of ignorance what would be the action of cowardice just just a passing uh, thought it's not not related to to the discussion uh, but yes steve Good. No, you're right. Just to just to bounce off you, I did notice that there's four of each. There's uh, four virtues, wisdom, temperance, justice, and courage. And there's four groups of uh, of passions, uh, um, lust, yeah, lust, fear, delight, and distress. So I thought I thought the same thing. There might be the, the reason why the Stoics made these pair, made, made, made these all in fours was because maybe they said there, you know, a good solution to this uh, passion was or vice was, um, was this virtue. It was like a prescription almost the doctor would give you like you have anger use this virtue to to um uh solve it. um i guess just to begin the discussion uh that's a really good question um i'm not necessarily sure i think for example as if we talk about anger um i i definitely think though i definitely think temperance and self-control is the first thing you should be thinking about because the whole point of waiting and postponing anger is self-control um but for example i think i would also call somebody who is attempting to resolve their anger and using these methods is also courageous as somebody who is um taking that leap and uh using these methods that they have never tried before um yeah uh, breaking this habit and practice of anger um, that they've always had in their past life as a, as taking, as using courage actually. So I think you can also find elements of maybe more or less of, 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 of some than others, but um, I think it takes more than one virtue sometimes to, um, uh, to solve, let's say solve or extirpate to remove a, a passion like anger. But you are right. I think, like for this specific passion, temperance is very high up there. It's it's a cor correlation, I think, between that and anger. That if you want to solve your anger problem, you need you need to be better tempered. Um. Actually, just to conti continue, if nobody else had anything else, I actually had another question that goes along with your question, actually. And I actually was saving this for another meetup. And we can do this in another meetup. But I was wondering, were the Stoics missing any virtues? Um, so Tony mentioned patience. And I guess one could argue patience might be underneath the heading of, of temperance, maybe a kind of a subcategory. Um, but I wonder if there are details in the virtues that the Stoics never explained. Um, patience, for example, or um, I was thinking about another one yesterday. I was thinking about um, humility. Um, these kinds of virtues, are there any virtues missing that might actually help with anger is what I'm asking. Are there any virtues that are not listed in these main four that might also help you to, to solve your anger problem that might be in line with Stoic virtues as well? <laughs> A sense of humor. <laughs> a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really good no, one. <laughs> no, I, I, I know I said it half, half jokingly, but yeah, I really think so. It's like if you have a sense of humor, especially about yourself, um, that's um, uh, a good weapon against all kinds of, or good tool uh, against all kinds of um, ideas that you otherwise might get about yourself or about the world around you. 
that um, are not necessarily maybe a hundred percent accurate. Abdul, and then Tony. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I would say it's for me. It's I feel it's better to have um, four broad virtues and drag everything underneath what we think it should be classified in. Um, um, I know some people would would hate the broadness of uh, stoicism. I think we, we went through that in the last week's meeting, um, or maybe the week before, where it doesn't really specify exactly what to do and what not to do. Maybe for people who are... Th- like into getting um, specific guidelines, it may not be suitable uh, for them to start here uh, with stoicism. Um, yeah, I would say for those who are seeking meaning in terms of follow, following um, um, as directly, I mean, literally specified um, philosophical approach may not like the way that stoicism is going. But for me, I'm really enjoying the broadness. Like I can construct my stuff on my own. I don't like limitation. Uh, and I feel that's why, that what makes stoicism stand out for me, maybe not the others. Thanks, Abdul. Uh, Tony. <laughs> It's just, just a very brief point on what Phil was saying about a, a sense of humor. Um, there's just a quote somewhere that says, you know, if you, if you look at yourself with a sense of humor, you never run out of subject matter. Um, there'll always be something there to laugh at. And yeah, it's something that we need to be mindful of, looking inward as well as outward. And uh, Shaham. Older. Yeah, I'm having trouble um, hearing. I'm not sure if it was just me. Um, but yeah, yeah, you were slow when you were speaking. I don't know if it was just me or, or Philip, I guess her too. Oh. We couldn't hear you. All right. I think you're better now. We can speak to start hearing you. Yeah. I don't know. Now is better, yeah. Okay. Have a bit. I think, okay, yeah, I think you're broken up now. Um, I, we hear you a few, a few words and then, and then you stop. Okay. <laughs> um, we can come back to you, Shakam. I'll come back to you later. Um, Abdul, I think you raised your hand, right? Yeah, I just wanted to say, for example, um, sense of humor. Maybe it's it's coming between wisdom and uh, temperance. Um, and for example, you cannot be serious all the time. Uh, so temperance, I think, is about also having decency on or, or, and moderation in everything we do in life. So being serious all the time is really <laughs> not the right thing to do, um, at least for me. Uh, but the same with wisdom. Like maybe it's wise to be humorous sometimes um, uh, to to um, make make people uh, enjoying being around you, I guess. But yeah, again, um, sense of humor is important. Um, but again, it, it's it's not maybe maybe uh, for me it's okay to not. Uh, having it specified exactly but but again it's yeah 
I'll leave it there because I think I'll get toxic on that. <laughs> No, I think it's I think it's good you mentioned a couple of these things. Um, I mean, I, I'm always one to prefer the details. I, I can read endlessly on theory and scholarship on the virtues and problem problems with them and uh, theory with them. But um, I also I also agree that there's a difference between theory and practice. That that's okay for theory, but in practice, you can I think having these broad um, ideas is a lot better to apply because that there's a um I, I don't I can't quote or cite and this is also my fault the exact psychological study but in uh, as a teacher when we study learning theory it is um it is commonly understood that people can only have in their heads anywhere between five or four and maybe maybe eight things uh, so this is why whatever you do a, a lesson you only put on the board, you, whatever you're teaching, you always boil it down to anywhere between four and six, maybe five at most, they recommend principles. Um, because those are very easy to for people to remember. Um, and they're then they're also easy for people to apply. Um, so you don't get into the too many details. You don't have an extended list of 20 different principles. Um, you just mention those four or five and then that people can absorb them a lot easily, a lot more easily. So I think you're right. I think there is something to the the broadness of it. It's not just, it's not being shallow. You're e you're making it easily applicable when you boil these details down into principles. Um, even even though if there are contingencies or, or different things, there's uh, get different um, um, corollaries to these principles and, and statements. It's it's a lot easier to apply it when you're when you're boiling it down to just four. Yeah, and I really, I just wanted to mention, I really like the point you mentioned about um, uh, wisdom, and that it's, um, uh, um, it's, it's, it's wise to make fun of yourself. It's wise to um, have a sense of humor and to, um, uh, I, I think of um, the, uh, and, and they're obviously doing this for entertainment purposes, but um, I, of, I often think of, um, uh, there's a specific art form in Italy called Commedia dell'arte. I don't know if anybody knows it. Um, it's traditionally you wear it with um, uh, you wear it with masks, um, but over the course of centuries, it's become where you don't have it with masks. And they do these things where they prepare um, for their theatrical performances with like they call it face stretching. Literally, they'll just uh, they'll do, do like a bunch of face stretching before the performances. And the idea is to, when you put on a comedic performance, you do it exaggeratingly. Like imagine slapstick in person and you're really doing it exaggeratingly. And I think in real life, you, you <laughs> shouldn't always do those acts, but having that mindset of being goofy sometimes or having that sense of humor and laughing at yourself is, is a, um, a very wise thing in the long run, not just in the short run. Um, that's unfortunate. I was going to go back to Shakam and see if he, uh, Shakam. I don't. I don't know if um, uh, you want to try again. Maybe it's been solved. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. it's fine. <laughs> The only thing we could hear was your resignation. It's like, <laughs> no, it's, it's yeah. fine. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. the only thing that came through. It started off, it started off, well, okay, silence, and then, oh. <laughs> um, so I, I had a list going, Abdul, Tony, then Shakam, um, and then we came back to Abdul. Um, I mean, would anybody like to say anything else on, on the virtues? And on, I think because we spoke a lot about um, the, are the virtues enough? Um, but if you want to respond to Shakam's state question as well a little bit more, like are there, 
is there a correlation between anger and the virtues? Is there maybe a virtue that you find that um, that you think could best help reduce your frequency of anger to um, uh, to make your anger more manageable and eventually eliminatable? Yeah, I'll speak if that's okay. I don't know whether yeah. it's a virtue, um, but it's certainly an attribute which I've found very useful as a tool over many years, which is just staying calm um, in stressful situations. And I found that as a child, when I was in difficult situations, um, being calm and having a steely mind can have a really dramatic effect on people around you, people who are angry, because they would expect a similar reaction. And when they don't receive that reaction, it has a positive effect. Um, it sort of nullifies that anger. So obviously it's not a virtue, but staying calm and having a steely mind, I find are very useful tools in stressful situations. Um. I'll speak. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Um, I think this is an excellent um, uh, lead um, back to the more practical um, part of the discussion, maybe um, what you just said, um, because I'm really curious. And I mentioned this before that um, uh, there is um, like a big focus on, um, you know, preventing getting angry and on anger. Um, but as far as I've come, uh, uh, like I said, the first two books, um, I haven't found very much about um, what do you do once you get angry. And it's like, um, the Seneca portrays is kind of like a black and white, you're angry or you're not. And when you're angry, like you're you're beyond reason and you're, you know, it's like, there's no arguing with you. And um, I don't really get that level of angry very often that, you know, it's like smashing doors and, and yelling and this kind of thing. It doesn't really happen to me. It's more like the you know, low key annoyed, and maybe you know I don't behave the way that I like to, but um, it's not this like blind rage that I fall into. So my question is, um, like, uh, practically speaking, like, what what do you do in such a situation? Because yes, um, it's too late to pause. Um, maybe your mind is not really in a state that is receptive for looking at. Uh, another person's point of view. Um, so um, yeah, how, how, how do you um, go about to, to, um, to calm yourself when you reach a point where you're very angry um, and you don't manage to, um, to intercept this uh, onset of, uh, of anger? Yeah, sure can. Uh, I think I am back uh, with you guys. Uh, That's perfect. Very <laughs> clear. Yeah, the connection uh, is green, and I'm ready to go. Um, right. So, <laughs> what I wrote in chat, um, in fear that uh, I might uh, never come back, is that if we see anger as ignorance of other people, and well, ignorance is the basic human state of existence. Uh, if we could have um, just read each other's uh, thought, we could know exactly what's going on. We won't be ignorant of uh, other people's motivations. Uh, we'll have complete um, uh, empathy, and as a result of that, no anger. So the car that cut you twice might have been the most awful driver in the world, or they might uh, just not have seen you. But you don't have this knowledge. You can't have this knowledge without um, actually talking with the person. And... Um, if you have the wisdom and 
if you try to think about the other person's point of view and develop this empathy, then there will be less place uh, for anger. So I think wisdom can also help uh, mitigate anger. Yeah, I, I know it's uh, like, uh, um, I wanted to um, reply to uh, Abdul's um, statement about how broad is uh, stoicism. I know it was like uh, an hour ago. <laughs> Um, for me, this is the difference between religion and philosophy. And that's why uh, I like uh, philosophy that much. Um, when you uh, are more busy asking questions um, and building, a, how to say, this resilience and a way of thinking, a new experiences and new details a, are a welcomed thing. A broad, broadening your horizon is a welcome thing. A, but religion has a, this tendency to do the opposite, to give answers. And when new and conflicting answers come, then you have to choose between the new answers and what you got from religion. So the vagueness and broadness um, and non-descriptive uh, prescriptive nature of uh, stoicism, it's a major strength and one of the reasons it's still relevant um, 2,000 years later. Um, in a way that, like, 2,000-year-old religion is completely irrelevant. Yeah. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Abdul. Yeah, thanks. I do agree with uh, Shukam. Um, especially with the last point he mentioned about the broadness of uh, stoicism. Um, but again, uh, returning back on how to maybe uh, deal with anger or other people being angry or maybe a situation where things are not supposed to happen and, say, and, and the way it happened. Uh, it is indeed important, I feel, that to show others what how you feel about it especially if your feelings are justified. I mean, if something inappropriate happened, you should say this is inappropriate. I'm not pleased with it. This is, I mean, I think this is, this should be the, for me, the minimum response for um, any inconvenient situation that you fall in because others, the way I think about it, other, other, the other, the other, party had the opportunity of showing their feelings and thoughts and they were inconvenient for me so I do feel it's only fair to show this in the same way now <laughs> such situation situation may backfire sometimes um, uh, you think that uh, you did the right thing but then um, you sometimes know this person would be more triggered if you uh, even ex expressed such uh, uh, emotions. So it may be unwise sometimes to respond, but other times I do think, especially if those things don't happen that often and they happen, uh, you have the choice to either ignore it or maybe say, um, I'm not quite pleased with that uh, for such and such and such. This is better than saying, okay, let me wait and think of better response. You can still have the time to think about a better response, but at least you show initial uh, response by saying, I'm not pleased what, with what, what, what's been said because other people may take advantage of 
saying uh, harmful things to you, thinking that you are um, not going to uh, respond to them. And yeah, for me to avoid falling in this pet peeve or misunderstanding of others, I do feel it's important to make that clear. For example, even if they were offensive, you can respond back saying, oh, I can easily be offensive back to you, but I don't think it's wise to do so. Um, <laughs> I mean, such I mean, such response, I'm not saying that's the only thing that you can do, but um, showing your emotions to others is important because chances that you will be responding negatively to someone who has nothing to do with it may be quite uh, significant. For example, you will burst up at your friend because they did the very minor yet annoying thing. They have nothing to do with your uh, negative emotions. You're annoyed because of someone else. So you better show someone else your disapproval instead of, instead of showing it to the wrong person. Because, yeah, I felt that some of my friends uh, felt into that. Even myself felt into that in the past. Um, but I'll leave it there because, yeah. Uh, Tori and then in Shikam. It's a very interesting point, uh, Abdul. I think for me personally, the approach that I try to take is, you know, what good will come of this um, if I do react? Um, and we're just adding fuel to the fire. And, you know, silence can be an extremely powerful tool, never underestimate it. You know, your silence can speak more powerfully than, than how you could articulate your argument. Um, so that's just something I've learned. Yes, sir. Um. Yes, so uh, okay, I don't know how where to where to begin. Um, so this overreaction, um, you know, getting really angry because of minor things, um, is usually um, can be from just overall stress. Uh, that somebody has a, in their life, and then these minor things are the last straw. Or it can be like a defense mechanism. If this person uh, is feeling or felt um, uh, oppressed, and um, you know he, his needs uh, weren't. Um, being uh, considered uh, early in his life, uh, every minor, um, uh, how say, um, thing can trigger these feelings from uh, from before, and in 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 my personal experience, I, I have this. Uh, a version this even it's like a fear of being angry. I feel that uh, even little amount of um, saying what what I need uh, in a direct way is is like being uh, rude and uh, angry and offensive, which is of course not uh, not based in reality. So I posted uh, this um, four types um, of a uh, response to a challenge uh, from uh, Robertson's uh, uh, book. Um, and I feel that uh, you can, I'll say, have different um, responses to different uh, situations. And the best one um, is the fourth one, being uh, assertive, being confident, without being uh, angry, unreasonable, without hiding uh, behind a, a facade, uh, being passive aggressive. And it's, it's hard to do. <laughs> 
it's really hard to do because um, my first uh, response is being passive aggressive and just uh, you know yeah let, let's get uh, it's over with um, and it's not healthy and being explosive over minor things it's also it, it's not helpful um, and so yeah I, I want to talk about this but yeah Steve um, yeah and just to echo this there's actually a couple of there's actually a tactic I like to use um, is that when I am I'm having a difficult conversation with somebody and I need to express my views before I do that I always preface it with and not always it depends on who I'm talking to if I'm talking to a friend that I've known for years and we can talk casually with each other we can maybe say something off the cuff like kind of rudely or directly and we'll get it we'll understand each other so I think it's based on context if I have a really good friend I've known for 10 years we can be a bit direct with each other than I would with other people and that's okay but like for example if I'm talking with a colleague or I'm talking with somebody that I don't really know or is maybe has a different kind of relationship to me than a, than a friend or family I would always begin it with um, I understand where you're coming from. I see you. And I'll, 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 then after that, I'll repeat their argument. And I forget, I've heard this from somewhere. This is not mine. I've heard this from some there years ago when I started practicing it. I just forget where I got it from. But I use that. It's like a phrase. I'll, I'll say, like, I understand where you're coming from, where I see you. And then I'll repeat, like, a kind of a sound bite of their argument to, under, to make them understand I understand where they're coming from. And then I'll say my point of view because they, they, they um first of all they can never logically say that you don't understand them or that you're coming off rudely second of all you're doing yourself a service by understanding their point of view and making kind of checking yourself to see if your point of view is even worth saying anymore because you want to check for yourself if if their point of view is correct or not something that um and i i realized that this is what i've been doing and uh something gonzalo i also say something gonzalo said last week is also something similar Gonzalo mentioned that when we're having a discussion here, um, and something I'll say now, is that um, he recommended saying this, this is what works for me. And I'll say this about what I'm doing now. Like, I'll say, this is what works for me, Abdul. This is not something that has to work for you, but it might. Because uh, he, this is also like a key phrase I thought was really useful, he recommended. Because when you're having a conversation like as Shakam said, like in philosophy or stoicism, where you don't have all the answers, you raise more questions than you do, that you you kind of want to say, this is what works for me, because you know it works in context, and it may not work for everybody. Um, but these kind of short phrases, this is what works for me, I understand you, is kind of what helps me um, put a little bit of structure so that I am being assertive and respecting them and in accord with my personal values rather than being too aggressive or rude or direct. Yeah, go ahead, Abdul. Yeah, thanks. Um, firstly, I, I, I would like to uh, reiterate that um, what, what Tony said regarding silence. I do agree silence is, uh, uh, is an underestimated uh, response because many people, they don't consider it as response, but it's very powerful response. For me, I do uh, follow multiple um, approaches depending on the situation. Um, but yeah, if I think that this should be ignored, then yes. Uh, although I'm not easily triggered by others' uh, actions. Um, but still, um, yeah, I, I, I would choose silence many times. But sometimes if I think that I need to um, respond or deal with whatever has been said, the minimum response for me would be that, to say, um, I'm not pleased with what, what's been said for this reason, this reason, this reason. Um, at least I had the chance to um, respond. Um, I mean, of, of course, because I thought that it was worth responding to, um, not because for the sake of, um, yeah, no one can... Uh, uh, like uh, win when they argue with me. In fact, winning an argument 
he can win an argument by silence uh, 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 multiple times, I would say. And yeah, just to end up, being, that's that's what worked for me. It's not a definite thing. <laughs> yeah, um, I agree with you, Steve. Yeah, um, it's it's always important to um, use such phrases when when communicating with others, considering contests and whether you know this person for a long time or not. Uh, Philip. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, um, what you said, um, um, it is very effective to, to make the other person feel like they're being hurt and, and, and such. Um, what uh, um, uh, Osaka put in the chat about the four um, different uh, response types. Um, this is a very, very interesting, um, I think, an exercise to observe yourself when you um, respond in what way, because I think it has a lot to do with the dynamics of the situation. It's like, I tend to have the tendency to, um, or I have the tendency, to, and I, I think I'm not the only one, to do what I can get away with. Um, and that's a horrible um, um, way to to conduct yourself sometimes and like this this type of um looking at a situation um usually like i regret afterwards when i realize that i'm falling into this so what i mean by that as an example is right whether you're aggressive uh in your response to something is if you think that you can get away with it and right? if you feel that oh there's going to be um reprisal or there's going to be negative um uh yeah like some, some kind of negative outfall, then you you have the ability not to be aggressive, but you're doing it for very selfish reasons. And that is um, usually when I realize that, you know, like this is something that I'm absolutely not proud of. Like if I'm getting aggressive in this situation, I know I have the ability not to say anything and respond in a different way. Because if, say, for example, I'm in an argument with my boss, you know, who's in a, you know, there's like a, there's a power gradient. And I know that if I start yelling at my boss, I'm out of a job in no time. Um, so I don't. Uh, this is a completely fictitious example, by the way, but um, I think it illustrates the idea. But if I'm, for example, in, in a situation where I can get away with it, responding angrily, aggressively, um, then I'm much more likely to actually do it. And so this is, um, yeah, this is when I find myself being embarrassed and, and, um, not proud of um, my response, and it's like I, I don't even think it's about winning an argument so much, um, but it's um, about um, entering and exiting a discourse in a way that you can um, be assertive, um, assert yourself, assert your opinion, and then like if you um, if, if if you think about it, an argument as a thing that you can win, um, I don't think you'll actually win any argument. Like uh, if you go in with the idea of I'm going to change everybody's mind, um, then um, that is usually not going to to get you anywhere. Um, yeah. Yeah, Tony. Yeah, interesting point. Well, I, uh, I, I'm a firm believer that there's no winners if you're arguing. Yeah, it's, it's trying to force your point of view down somebody's throat is just pointless. Um, but what you said was interesting as well um, about you feeling embarrassed about your um, your actions. The very fact that you realise that your actions may not be conducive with the way you'd like to be is quite a courageous act in and of itself. Um, so realising it and wanting to change it is the spark, and you have that spark. A lot of people don't. So, you know, I wouldn't be too hard on yourself, Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know it's the um, uh, I know it's the kind of the end of the um, two hours, but I also just keeping on this theme of like what works for us and like tactics of um, uh, something I, I know that Seneca has mentioned that actually in CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, 
Uh, and if, if you guys um, remember or have, have read a little bit, this kind of second wave CBT, which is, I think, a bit more dominant. Um, uh, but, um, uh, but something I noticed that I also tend to do is, um, or at least I've been tending to do more now, is challenge or dispute my beliefs. Um, and something they also recommend. They also recommend, I, I remember um, uh, this is something, uh, Shakam, if you also remember um, Donald Robertson's interview in Stoic Psychology, um, he mentions this um, in this podcast that um, when you are feeling angry or you're feeling a passion and you, uh, and you want to confront that or reflect on that, you first think it's if you're to understand it's a belief about something it's not it, it can be changed and um it's uh it's a belief about the worldview not the worldview or reality itself and the second thing he says is that there's two kind of views in cognitive behavioral therapy one is that you dispute it and you challenge it so you seek to either confirm it or correct it by scrutiny and, and critique or you you kind of you kind of accept it but um uh I, and I'm not too well versed in what that really means. I would think that you kind of accept the fact that uh, you believe this, you understand that this is something happening to you, and um, you you go on to um, uh, understand that this is not something perhaps to act on, but something you understand and you accept it as, as a part of you and something that's done to um So I'm not well versed in the, the third wave cognitive behavioral therapy and acceptance. I really like to challenge my beliefs it kind of makes me feel a little bit stronger afterwards. So when I when I um, recognize that I feel angry or have this belief about this other person and I challenge that to myself, I kind of, I um, I have this completely new perspective. It changes, it changes the way which your mind thinks really. It, um, uh, it, it makes you feel less like you're in the, like in the long run. At least this is not something I'm feeling too much, but I guess in the long run, you can practice this enough. Um, you're really supposed to start stop making assumptions and judgments about people um, when you do this constantly and reflect and critique and dispute, like challenge your beliefs. Um, you stop assuming and judging people even from the outset. This is kind of like a in the short term, it's practice after the fact, but in the long run, it's supposed to I think help prevent you from ever assuming or judging people. It's something that I'm trying to do more often. Um, does does anybody have a response, or does anybody else um, have anything else to say? Okay. Um, uh, so um, this is kind of the end of our uh, end of our two hour uh, meetup today. Um, I have uh, my usual questions. Um, and, uh, before, um, before my last question though, I kind of want to flip them. The first thing I want to ask is how did you like this meetup and what can I do better as an organizer? If anybody has any recommendations, tips or observations they made. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for even doing this. Like this is, um, I know this is, uh, probably a lot of work and um i um yeah really appreciate your your doing this it's fantastic um i don't have any um recommendations i think you're doing a fantastic job um guiding those uh discussions um preparing a topic every week um and looking up sources and material i think uh, it's um it's been much more um i, I think the last over the last two months or so, um, it's developed in a, in a very um, productive and healthy direction where there's always um, something prepared, a topic. And um, yeah, I just want to say I really, really appreciate this. It's, um, you're doing a really, really good job. Thank you. No, of course. Um, and um, thank you for joining, really. Otherwise, it'd just be me talking about philosophy to myself. <laughs> Yeah, um, which has happened almost once. There was one meeting where it was, uh, I thought it was just me and then Shikam jumped on and then we decided, I think, to uh, to uh, 
Hey, well, no, it was just in person. I think this was in person, Shikam. I think maybe it was you who came to a meetup uh, in person uh, late last year, and there was nobody else, and we decided to just have a few words and then leave. <laughs> um, but it's uh, really thankful. Thank you guys for for joining and uh, bringing the knowledge that you have. My last question is: um, I kind of have this idea for the next three meetups what to do because this is actually a time of year that there's a few things going on. The first thing is I kind of wanted to do a meetup on women in Stoicism um, because we just passed International Women's Day and it would be really useful, I think, to have um, just another, um, it, this wouldn't really be something that's practical, practical, but this would be um, maybe an hour and a half um, meetup where we would just, just discuss women in Stoicism, what we've missed, and maybe um, what does Stoicism say about women, actually? Because they say different things. I know if you look at Seneca or um, 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 uh, um, I think it was Epictetus's teacher uh, or Mosonius, Seneca's. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, he was also quite egalitarian about the matter. They say different things, I think it would be interesting to say. Um, uh, I see you, Abdul. Um, so I was thinking of a lineup. Next week would be women in Stoicism. The week after would be on the Socratic method. I suggested that. I was asking about that because I remember Tony said something about the way in which we do discussions. I thought it'd be interesting to do basically a meetup on how the Stoics and Greek philosophers did philosophy, how they spoke about it day to day. Um, and then the week afterwards is the first weekend in April. And I thought we would do something on Marcus Aurelius because that was the month of his birth. So... Um, it's also considered the, the in honor of him the month of service for Stoicism. So I thought this would be a nice a nice lineup. Um, uh, Abdul. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I think it will be interesting to hear what Stoicism thinks about um, uh, women. Uh, I, I'm wondering if we can also add to that um, what Stoicism think about relationships, maybe with significant other or spouse. Uh, I think it'll be kind of relevant. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, maybe something of relevance to include. Um, maybe you can bring it up. I mean, definitely. I think you can. <laughs> um, it, I, uh, no, I like the idea generally. I like the idea of, of doing it, um, uh, but it's. Uh, it, I think it would be a weird transition to jump from talking about women in Stoicism to all of a sudden jumping up into a discussion about relationships uh, between uh, it's romantic relationships between men and women. That that seems a bit. Um, I don't know if, uh, for me, but the whole um, order doing that in that order would seem a bit. Um, uh, I don't want to use the word misogynistic. But I, I understand where you're coming from, but because uh, I have also had um, taken from stoicism in my relationships too, but I, I don't want to make it seem like the only time we talk about relationships in stoicism is when we talk about women in stoicism. You know what I'm saying? That, that's the only thing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but I also have this idea maybe then in the future, we have different meetups on entirely different modern topics. Like, what does Stoicism say about relationships and love? What does Stoicism say about friendships and things like that? Uh, we can do that as well. We can have, like, entire Stoic meetups on that. Um, uh, Philip. Thank you. Um, I like the idea about talking about relationships um, because, uh, and this might be uh, separate, I um, not from the idea about um, that you just uh, suggested, um, because um, yeah, it can be difficult actually being in a relationship and at the same time being um, try to maintain emotional distance um, to a lot of the emotion. Like you know, a relationship is by, by its very nature an emotional bond, and it's one of the things that we're trying to do is like moderate the emotions. So it's like there's an inherent conflict of interest in there, and in, or there's at least the potential um, for that. So that might be an interesting topic about the. Um, women in stoicism i think it's a it's a really nice idea um the only concern um is like uh, today it's uh the five of us um doing most of the talking and eva is listening in so it's like um you know five five guys talking about women um so maybe if um we could find 
um, either um, some I, 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 I don't know if, um, no, I, I don't want to say you know a, a presenter a, a female presenter or a female um, guest speaker or something like that um, that might be um, a bit more appropriate maybe um, actually just to jump in that's a really good idea <laughs> and then, you know what you know what? it's not a it's not really a bad idea I mean like why why in why in anyone's name should I be organizing and presenting a stoic meetup on women when a woman should be doing it um, mm -hmm. no it does make sense um, yep. Eva um, it would be fantastic if uh, if um, we could have your input we don't want to be doing this without um without a woman participating and without maybe you um you're the only woman who's, who's really been consistently joining i think elena <laughs> yeah was a was somebody who was joining in the first several meetups we had last year and she was really consistent af, af, um, up until the point we had online meetings um but uh, it would really be great to hear somebody um uh, somebody who's not a white man um, ta um talking and speaking about women and stoicism Absolutely. Actually, I love the topic idea and uh, I support 100%. I just need to think about it, like how to do it. Perfect. Thank you. Um, uh, I'll talk to you maybe further in Telegram, um, because uh, if if you do full on organize it, um, I can give you some access to set up the event um, and to write some words about the event and to post some articles and resources and things like that. You can when when you set up the event. So um, if that's okay with you, sounds good. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, I was thinking actually before I before I get back to Shakam and Philip, actually it might not be a bad idea to talk about. Um, relationships and touch upon it only because when Philip mentioned emotions, perhaps the women in stoicism have something different to say about the passions and about emotions. So it may not be a bad idea to talk about emotions and what women have to say about them as well in stoicism. So um, yeah. Shakam and then and back to Philip. Okay. Oh, uh, Philip. No, no, sorry, uh, sorry, that, that, that's totally fine. Okay, um, Shakam. Um, yeah, I just want to say, um about the uh, modern uh, stoicism and then uh, um, uh, Philip um, also um, posted it. Uh, it's on the 25th of April. There's the Mar Marcus Aurelius uh, anniversary virtual uh, conference and we can build around that. Um, it's a Sunday so we can have a uh, like, um, special Marcus Rose focus uh, the day before um, or earlier, I don't know. Yeah, Abdul. And then I think, and then I think I'm going to close it out after, but Abdul. All right. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, it's more, maybe it's more relevant, oh, for sure, it's more relevant to talk about relationships when it comes to talking about emotions because, um, uh, it's more involved there and just realize they both broad yet important topics when we talk about women and relationships so putting them together isn't the best way but yeah really looking forward to um, next week's um, event um, and yeah um, thanks for hosting this and thanks for having me of course um, yeah thank you guys um yeah, absolutely, Philip. Yeah, it would be great to have like a get together. Um, uh, we could, I don't know, um, uh, maybe join the the conference while joining here. I don't know if that's possible. Um, uh, but um, yeah, absolutely. We also be have like a. It would also be good theoretically to have a Berlin Stoic speed up and then go to that um, if if it's allowed in Berlin by that time. Actually, it might be as as things start to sound, sound like they're winding down. Some certain shops are opening up, and I don't know. So, um, okay. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, for joining our meetup today. And you'll hear more news soon about the next few weeks. So, have a good weekend. And uh, remember, this week, continue practicing and reflecting on your emotions. Uh, practice the strategies on anger management and anger extirpation. And um, good luck to everybody. 
Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks. Steve. Thanks, folks. Bye. See you. Ciao.